I carry in me those that have been missing for 400 years. Those that sang songs about their past while they held back their tears. Those that disappeared from my lineage. I stand on their shoulders. If you see me, they are here. Unfaunu de. Uwekino. Yasabi mono. Those who in the blink of an eye you would instantly recognize because although some language and color may have changed, our voices and mannerisms remained the same. Contabai. Boa drumi bon. Botacordami. Now as seedlings we are paying homage to our tree because we were mixed and scattered to build other civilizations, forced to serve at the thrones of other nations, but we, we never forgot the truth because we, we are poets, we are scholars, we are warriors, we are you, comment allez-vous? As-tu bien dormi? Tu ne me reconnais pas? Without shackles weighing us down, we long to come home. Because if our past remains a mystery, we will never be free. How are you? Did you sleep well? Do you recognize me? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Onias Landfeld. <clears throat> Thank you. Poet, storyteller, and theater maker. And with this, we open tonight the second of four talks in this 13th edition of the Amsterdam Storytelling Festival. Thank you so much for being here, the people in the studio, as well as everyone back home, logging in behind your screens from the laptop, the tablet, the Facebooks, the Instagrams. Um, we are here for this particular talk to discuss a topic that for me is especially interesting, diving into our dark past. Now, if you've been following the Storytelling Festival, you know that myself, as well as my co-director, Rafael Rodan, we have made quite a few shows that deal with the dark pasts of our own histories, being artists and theater makers from Iran, as well as Israel. And we've talked about the beauty of our background, the difficulties, the animosities that exist there, the hidden and not so hidden pains of our cultures and the past of ourselves. Um, we are also Dutch theater makers. We have transposed our lives to this earth at some point, and we find it incredibly interesting sometimes to change the direction of our work, that camera. For me specifically, it is um, something that became interesting, became important when I found myself uh, developing as a storyteller in what today is called the uh, uh, Royal Institute of the Tropics, the Koninklijke Instituut van de Tropen, um, but which is a place that many years before I was born was still called the Colonial Institute of the Tropics. A beautiful building in the east of Amsterdam which housed all the treasures that the Dutch had sucked from their various colonies to be displayed for the people of the Netherlands. Um, it is a conversation that is important today, not just because we have these buildings that are remnants of this past, but because today, more than ever, we are discovering and rediscovering these stories. We're diving into them, whether it's uh, through discussions about the statues that we should keep or throw into the water, whether it's around the topics of the Black Lives Matter movement or one of the many other topics that we can dive into. We will discuss it here in the uh, in Podium Mosaic with the two artists that I've invited. Onias, you already heard him speak his poem, but we also have Abhishek Tapar, a, an Indian uh, theater maker and storyteller who will give a perspective not directly related to the Netherlands, but to India and the UK, right? But let's start with uh, Onias, now that we've heard your voice. A powerful poem, which has a particular direction, right? <laughs> yeah. Which uses a few different languages. I heard English, I heard French, I heard... Uh, uh, Papiamento, mm -hmm. and the language of my mom and my dad, which is uh, Alcans and Saramakan. So five different languages. Yeah. And you speak it for whom? Well, it, it is essentially, it's, it's for the people who share my history essentially for them, but it's also directed at those that recognize people like me or, or 
better say, better yet, don't recognize people like me that do not know where I come from. And uh, in that poem, I say, um, well, we are you. These are the languages that, that you gave us. Um, in one of my shows, Roots and Cassava, I explained that I am, um, this, I, I am part of, of an investment that you made. I am your investment, and guess what? Payment is due. Mm. Because I, I'm, I'm, I'm created. I am, I'm, I'm a cosmic calculation because someone saw my species and said, well, these are tall, big people that can work, and they started to breed us. So um, I, am, I am that effect. Those, those decisions that, that, that certain people made all those hundred years ago, um, this is the effect of it, and you have to deal with it because I'm not going anywhere. Where am I supposed to go? <laughs> You're not going anywhere because yeah. you are a, a Dutch artist. Yeah. This is your soil as much as it's anyone else's. Yeah. Um, but again, that direction, it, it, it is someone who is a descendant of... Yeah. Um, I, one of my, my, my friends, she gave me a DNA test, and it turns out that my DNA is 100% African. It's 70% is from uh, the Nigerian area, 20% is from Sierra Leone, and 10% is from Kenya. So, um, without a shadow of a doubt, I am of African descent. So, the direction that this poem is, is, is going is for the people, that the diaspora, all across the world. Um, it's for me to them, I see you, I recognize you, I am just like you. I'm, I'm sure that I have family members, if you can still call them that, um, hiding out in Jamaica, somewhere in, 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 in the UK or in America, in Haiti, because we were scattered. So it is, it's, it's, it's sort of a rallying call, and it's a question, do you recognize me? Because I am you. Mm -hmm. this, this is what we look like. This is the languages that we, spe that we speak, and our voices may have changed, but, but our mannerisms, it's, it's the same. I will go to Haiti, and I will see food that I recognize. The, 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 you know, those, those things, they, they come back and it's recognizable. Yeah. So we're talking about um, dealing with the dark pages of our past. By the way, as I'm speaking with Onyas, as I will be speaking with Abhishek, I want everyone back at home to know that you can be part of this discussion. Uh, leave us comments on the social media and at some point we'll find the time to incorporate some of them back into this discussion. Um, but back to you, Onyas, mm -hmm. you say that your poem, your work, is a rallying cry, right? Yeah. And when we're dealing with these dark pages in our history, we're doing it now in 2020, yeah. it's definitely not the first time that we've been dealing no. with these stories. Can you say that the history of your work and the people before you is a history of rallying cries? Yeah. Yeah. My name is a rallying cry. Really? Yeah, it's, it's called Landfeld, but um, um, actually what my ancestors used to cry out when they went and fight against the colonial overlords was uh, Lantifa, which means land fear. So in 1863, when they, they officially abolished slavery in Suriname, but they had to work for 10 more years for free on the plantations, you had to register yourself. But they did not accept the name Lantifa, so it turned into Landfeld. But my name is a rallying cry, Lantifa, fear us, fear us, people who, who essentially have done nothing wrong, just the day of our birth. That, that was our crime, mm -hmm. and that's where I hail from. So um, when I make something in, in regards to my past, I want to show the people who share my ancestry that this is us, this is where we come from. Don't forget that. It is part of your identity, and you, you can do something with it. It's not something to be ashamed of, because I'm of maroon descent from, from my mom and my dad's side, and there was a time that if you were called a maroon, it was, it was seen as something negative. Um, you were stupid, you couldn't learn, you were backwards, now, and that's not true. Just, just to make sure that everyone knows what Maroons are yeah. in the historical context of Suriname? Yeah, those were, uh, Maroon people were, were, were well, th th that's the name that they, that they, uh, that they chose for themselves. Uh, there, there are different aspects of where the name comes from, but basically those are um, enslaved people who escaped the plantations, and uh, fled into the jungle and made civilizations for themselves. And they thrived. N until this day, they are still there. So the dark irony of your history is that the ones who escaped the enslavement yeah. 
and built their own civilization in the jungle yes. are seen as less civilized, as seen as less civilized, and simple people. There's there's a whole chunk of of the battle, uh, the, the battle that they did for for the abolishment of slavery that that people just forget, because um, all my names, um, my name is Musifata Onia Sakwense Yogunka, and all those names wait, they have. Wait, wait, Onia. <laughs> you I'm, can't I'm just jump I'm, over I'm your jump. names. <laughs> you have to really no, okay. tell them to us. <laughs> uh, actually, my my. My, my second name is Onias, but my first name is Musifata. And then uh, the other ones are Akwensetio and Gunguka. And all those names, I'm, I'm named after uh, founders of villages, um, uh, medicine men. Um, my, my first name, Musifata, that's the name of the person that, that established the first village um, um, in, in, in my father's, uh, in the people of my father's side. And that's something huge, because in the time of slavery, when you escape, wh where would you go? You needed a place where you could marry, uh, just just feel human again. And it's not that they were not human, but slavery has a tendency to break that in someone. So um, slavery has a tendency to break the humanity. The in humanity, someone. yeah. And what is the form in which that expresses itself? Well, it expresses itself in 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 fighting defiance, because it, it's a fight to hold on to that humanity. And, and then you are capable of doing things that you, you never thought that you could. And, and the fight, it resulted in, in fighting for their, for their freedom. Um, there's a story that a Jamaican enslaved person was deported to Suriname. His name is Boston Bent. And he came and he taught, he taught English to enslaved people. And he explained to them that in different parts of the world, you know, there's abolishment of slavery. So they were like, okay, well, if you thought we were bad then, now we're going to be a problem. So one of the names that I have, Akwensetio, is the name of one of the people that went to negotiate with the, with the colonial overlords for uh, peace. Actually, they sent a delegation, um, uh, the Netherlands, they sent a the delegation to the, uh, to the Maroons and they said, please make peace with us because when you attack our plantations, you're hurting our profit margins. So we need you to stop. So the peace was not in the sense of, okay, we see that you are human beings and what we're doing is wrong. We need to make peace because it will hurt our profit margin. So that, that thinking of, you know, this, this, this uh, everything for capitalism, it was way back then and it still exists now. So, uh, but, but to answer your question, it, it, it results in defiance. Hmm. And I think it's a good thing to defy that which is trusted upon you. And in the defiance, refine your humanity, Yeah, right? Yeah, because you have to, like I said, you have to fight to, to, to keep that. You have to fight to either regain it and keep it, and you have to fight not to be uh, the same as the people that enslaved you, because that, that, that is the whole difference. It, it, it is not, um, I, I, I grew up in, a, in a, uh, a Christian environment, and there was always something that kind of bothered me, and that was that you're taught to turn the other cheek. And I'm not, I'm not proclaiming do not turn the other cheek. I'm not saying that. But at, one po at what point do you come and you say, okay, enough is enough? Because that is something that was taught to a lot of black people. If something happens to you, you know, forgive. You need to forget. You need to forgive. But the bullets don't stop flying. You know, the, 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 the injustice, it, does, it doesn't stop. And I have a lot of conversations with people that said, well, the Netherlands is not America, so why are you, you know, it's, it's not a problem here. And I said, it's a problem because, one, the, <laughs> the people that are in the United States, those are the children of the Europeans. It's, it's, it's Europe, essentially, that is there right now. And to say, well, it's a, it's a problem over there, it's not a problem here, that is not what it means to be human. That's why you can sleep while there are atrocities in certain countries in this world. And that's why people could sleep while they enslaved half of Africa. So that, that argument, it doesn't fly with me. So, Onias, uh, in many of the things that you mentioned now, uh, I could hear this rallying cry of the person who is the keeper of a history. Yeah. You feel the history in your name. Yeah. You feel it in um, the stories passed down to yeah. you. You know that every single given name is someone who is responsible for something. Yeah. And some of your work is to keep that history in your community, right? Yeah. 
But yeah. we always know that a rallying cry has an effect on the people who come for it, mm -hmm. but also the people that you will walk towards, right? <laughs> yeah. And I know because, you know, we haven't met today. Yeah. I've seen you speak in front of an audience where not everyone looked like you or yeah. like me. Some of those people were, well, let's just call it what it is, yeah. white people who yeah. were kind of terrified looking at you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite big. <laughs> I'm quite large. Uh, yeah, but um, in a sense, one, one, one part of me says, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not responsible for your fear. The way that you think, uh, I'm, I have a reason why I'm saying this. And I have a goal. And if you interpret it in a certain way, how much am I responsible for that interpretation? D.L. Udley, um, a comedian, he said, the scariest place for a black man to be is in a white person's imagination. Hmm. It's very scary to live in that, in, in that place. So I, I'm aware of that. And in, in most of my work, I say, this is not an attack. This is history. But it's truth. I don't sugarcoat it. Um, sometimes we laugh about it. We cry about it. Because that's, for me, that's what it means to be human. You laugh, you cry. But I don't sugarcoat it. But I also, um, I made the choice to um, not do it in a threatening way because I understand the audience that I'm talking to. That being said, I am not responsible for you being that fragile. So Anias, just, just to play devil's advocate a bit, yeah. you say that um, you know, as a big black man, you don't want anyone to be afraid of you, which yeah. I understand. Um, you say that fear is their responsibility, it's yeah. not your responsibility, but you are the descendant of people who call themselves Lantifer, yeah. land fear us. Yeah. And fear in that struggle was a very important tool. Yeah, because they said um, fear is the only language that they understand. So translating that into today, isn't there place in the struggle in dealing with these past pages, maybe, mm -hmm. playing devil's advocate, for a little bit of fear? <laughs> the fear that I try to instill is the fear of, of truth. And the truth uh, is that if, if magically people like you, me, were to disappear, who do you think they will come after next? They will come after the ones that did not study at the universities. They will come after the ones that don't have a, 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 a name that is, that is, you know, high up there or a rich family. They will come after them. That is the fear that I want to instill in them. I'm not the problem. I never was the problem. The problem is the way that this system is set up. This system is a system of... You know, we have to push something or someone down for us to be up there. So if the ones that are downtrodden disappear, they're all going to look for another victim. And since you're not the queen, you're going to take my place. That is the fear that I want to instill in them. So to, to just get it clear for myself and maybe for the people back home, um, when we talk about your struggle, you don't see this as a struggle between people with your skin color and someone with another skin color. You see it as a struggle between the, the people who have power and the people who don't. Yeah, I see, I see that. And, and, and you can argue that a certain thinking comes from... Um, from certain people, there, there is um, one of my favorite rappers, Black Todd, from, from The Roots. He has a new al album. And uh, a Native American person, uh, actually a First Nation person, he is speaking on the record. And he is explaining, when Columbus came here, he asked us, my people, who are you? And we said, we're human beings. And he said, oh, you're Indians. So they didn't understand the concept of being a human being. So if you have that thought, if you, if you think that way, and that was a European school of thought, and you, and, and you have that for years and years and years and years, um, at a certain point, um, the ones that you subjugate, you will, you will give that to them. Because they see, okay, in this world, the ones that have power, they take power, and this is how they rule. So I have to do the same thing. So what you now have is certain groups of people, and, 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 and you have that in Africa, you have that in Suriname, that the ones that have power... They, um, they seek to dominate another group. And that group looks like them, talks like them, has the same culture as them, but they will find something to use to keep them down so they can be up. So a struggle that keeps on 
yeah. reinventing itself in different forms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Onias that deals with this struggle, yeah. uh, this is the one that I'm very curious about, who lived a certain part of his life in Suriname. Yeah. You lived there the first 16 years of your life? Uh, 13. 13. 13. Well, it, it was on, on and off. I was born there. I came here when I was four. I went back when I was seven, and I came here when I was 13. Mm -hmm. So quite a significant amount of life also yeah. lived here, and yeah. then quite a significant amount of few years True. back in Suriname. Yeah. Um, in what part of the life does this seed of your, the motor of your struggle lie? Is it from what you left back there or what you found here or what was put in you here? It's what I left back there. Mm -hmm. My family, my, my people have a history of being displaced and you, you leave things behind. It, it started when they were enslaved and brought to Suriname. And um, for instance, my, my, my dad, he was born in this valley in Suriname and he, had a, he, he grew up in a village. And all of a sudden, the Dutch government at the time, they decided that they were going to flood that valley because uh, Alcoa, who, who mined uh, bauxite and, and made aluminum, they needed energy. So they flooded that valley and they displaced, and it was, I believe, in the 1960s, don't tell me now, and they uh, displaced a couple of thousand people, which is huge, it's a huge number in that time. And you and, 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 and villages were, were, were torn apart. And what my people do is, is um, they name their children or places after significant events that happened. So um, imagine the, 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 the dam is here and a couple of people, they went downstream and, and other people went upstream. So, so villages, they just fell apart and, and, and they have, have names, uh, literally translated, it's... Uh, one village is called uh, Fallen Apart. Mm. And because um, some leaders said, well, it's a man-made structure, it can break, and if it breaks, you know, it will flood everything downstream, we're gonna go upstream. But my dad, he wrote, a, he wrote an op ed and he said, um, I missed a significant part of my youth. I never had the chance to develop myself in the culture as my ancestors did. I, can, I, did, I don't have the African culture that was taken away from us. So now we were here and we developed, we made our own culture, our own language, and we have our own traditions. And again, I was robbed of that. So when I had to flee because of the, the civil war that was there, that started because, you know, colonialism and they left and they took everything with them and the struggles ensued, I left a whole part of my uh, identity in Suriname. I have cousins of the same age that stayed there. When I go there, I cannot connect with them in that way because they went, they went through a different part in life. And some things are not parallel anymore. So um, for me, it, it, it was a, I missed a lot. And, and I lived 20 years in, uh, in Tilburg. And I found out when I started to, performing, to perform and I came uh, to Amsterdam, that I missed a certain, you know, I, I missed my kind of people. I missed a, a, a certain way of thinking, a, a certain way of doing things. And I needed that without knowing that I needed that. So you're fighting a fight which is literally symbolized by a, a, a biblical flood in the valley of your yeah. father. Yeah. A story of literally wiping out where someone wiping comes from. Wiping out everything. They, yeah. they, he wrote a book about it and he said it's astonishing because the waters, they rose a meter a day. Mm -hmm. And he described how they, they, they rescued the animals. They rescued the animals. You know, the church building was starting to fall apart. And they told them, well, this is how they sold it to them. They sold it to them. Well, if you come with us, you won't have to cook over open fire anymore. We will have, you know, a place where you can go to school. We will have houses made out of wood. You know, it, it, it will be great. And when they came there, it was nothing. What they promised, it wasn't enough. And they, the government in that time, they had a habit of doing that because they, as, as, as I was telling him a, 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 a couple of minutes ago, the Dutch government invited people from India to come to Suriname. And when, when they came, there was nothing prepared for them. The same thing with the Indonesian people and the Chinese people. They had to build everything from the ground up. And it's the same. It's the same thing. We, we came here to the Netherlands, and um, when you came from Suriname to the Netherlands a couple of years ago, you were taught, that, uh, you were taught everything about 
uh, the Netherlands, uh, the provinces, the structure, the governmental structure, but they never taught you anything about Suriname. So you're there 9,000 kilometers that way, and they teach you something, and you come here, and you find out they change the rules. There's nothing set up for you. Who are you? I'm Dutch. No, you're not. Yeah. So only as if I may, because uh, we're going to continue this conversation yeah. in a bit, <laughs> but uh, in my own way, if I would summarize it, maybe the image of a writer who writes, first of all, what was flooded and taken away yeah. to recreate, and also maybe to build in your words that which was promised to you. Yeah. And you didn't get. I didn't get. Yeah. So, Onias, um, we're going to go back to you, and we're going to speak with Abhishek in a sec, but we're going to also listen to some music. Um, for the people who are here for the first time, uh, every day during these talks, we have an amazing singer-songwriter. Uh, his name is Erik Schoholm. He is a Finnish Swede. Uh, I'm guessing as a Swede, as a descendant of Vikings, there is also some dark pages of history there. But we invited him not to talk about that, but to <laughs> share his songs with us every time one that is inspired by the topic of the day. So, Eric, take it away. In the beginning, there was nothing but a dream. In the beginning, just like a picture in a dream We just thought of something better Thought of something we could believe in But in the beginning There was nothing but a dream So where do we go from here? Say we should hold back and keep our thoughts to ourselves. They say we should stay low and put our dreams on a shelf. When you believe in something better, believe in something yet to be found. It's in the beginning for you to stand your ground. Thank you so much. 
Uh, as we were having a conversation, some people on the social media, they send us some messages. All of them really nice. No one wanted to tell you off. No one wanted to uh, <laughs> say anything against what you said. Uh, Tamar from the audience said, I'm just very happy to sit in this crowd. Welcome for being here. And uh, Pasha from back home said, happy to watch for the first time. And it's nice. Good. We love nice. Thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, if you liked it, uh, also watch tomorrow and the day after. And also go back to the previous episode because it all stays online. Um, Abhishek, I'm going to go to you after one last question that I have to ask from Onias because I asked you to come to our theater with one object that for you physically embodies um, the relationship that you have with these stories. Yeah. Which is? This bracelet. Mm -hmm. So hold it out for the cameras to pick it, it up. Hold it for the camera. Okay, shiny. Ah, yes. I feel like I'm on, I'm, I'm on Telcel. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so um, what does this mean to you? Well, I got this bracelet from my dad. It was the day that um, we left Suriname in 1998. And he received it from a friend who went to Benin. And uh, they bought it there. But what it symbolizes for me is a connection with Africa and Suriname and, and that side of my dad because you can find these things in, in, in Suriname also. And the funny thing about um, objects like this is that we, we, the people of my, my dad, they're renowned for their wood carvings. And the, the way that they carve the wood, they make benches and tables. If you go to Africa, you see the same style, the same style, the same way of, of treating the wood. And um, it always astonishes me because, because it becomes real that there's a part of me there. So this, this, this actually, it's, it's, it's a broken, a broken uh, uh, bracelet. And, and, you know, it used to be round and then you have the chains. But now it's broken and it, it does symbolize that you can break free of the, those things that keep you bound up. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's a piece that he gave to me. I hold it dear, and um, I'm never going to give this away. Wow. A story of leaving, a last day in Suriname. Yeah. yeah. And a story of broken chains. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that with us. Yes. Uh, Abhishek, um, thanks for being part of this story, Thank of this you. life story that we're doing here today. Um, you are a theater maker and a storyteller from India, and you deeply deal with the past of your country, the current past, like the recent past or the older past. Um, when you hear the story of uh, Onias, uh, about how he deals with the story of his father, grandfather, great-grandfather, what are the parallels that you immediately sort of intuitively find with your work? I mean, uh, it's the... Um, I think that the quality of like uh, finding power dynamics or to, to finding uh, reclaiming power or to uh, making something uh, visible uh, which has uh, been long suppressed and to, to also dig down into sort of a uh, personal history through that opening up bigger sort of narratives and that has also been uh, like a tool which I've used uh, quite extensively for the last uh, four to five years now. And, uh, but uh, addressing something which is uh, invisible uh, and bringing it to the surface. And, uh, but also it's, it's a way uh, I, I re recognize like some of the strategies which you use. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure like if I use it like the same way, but it's, it's some sort of a subversion or I take a different route, maybe, perhaps. Uh, um, so to make yeah. it very concrete for the people who don't know your work, because yeah. some of the regulars of the Storytelling Festival know that uh, Abhishek was here last year with a piece that dealt with his family history in India. Mm -hmm. um, you have a piece that you made, I think, also a year ago, which dealt with um, the, the British colonial past in India. Yeah. Maybe you can explain to us what that, how that piece looked yeah, like. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a performance, it's called uh, Risk Lab. It was initiated by uh, Ada Mukami. Uh, she's a Russian artist, uh, was earlier based in uh, London, is, is now currently based in Berlin. And uh, she wanted to create, she created this performance, uh, which was a series of different provocations with different artists uh, around the topic of risk in different contexts. And she invited me to, to work with uh, her. And the, the way the setup happens is that it is a live performance. It happens in London, uh, whereas she's there in the theater with the audience. 
but the other collaborator is not present and the performance happens through either uh, Skype or you know, uh, different mediums. Uh, and she asked me, uh, so, so I was invited uh, for this project and we started to work and she asked me this very specific question uh, as to what risk-taking action I would take if I was in the UK. So I said I would uh, uh, go to the British Museum and steal all the objects and take it back to India. Uh, and then we started working on that, and the way it unfolds is, because uh, uh, I've lived in London for, for about two years, and uh, when I went there, I happened to visit the British Museum, and, uh, and I was quite amazed. I, I was going through different sections, and I happened to come across the South Asian section, uh, and particularly the Indian section, which was quite amazing, because this was kind of a part of the history which I was never brought up with. Uh, so I was going through all the objects and sort of trying to identify and pretty much all the labels started with a sentence called gift from the Raja of Travancore, gift from Raja of Ranjit Singh, gift and gift. Uh, and that was like uh, built, uh, it was a bit jolting because I was like, uh, I know that the Brits were here and um, I mean... Uh, your history the, wasn't one of gifting yeah. to the British, ah, yeah, welcome, I mean, welcome here. And yeah, I, mean, I mean, I know you're polite people, but <laughs> there's a limit, right? Yeah, I mean, they, yeah. they give us like the English language and all, but they were not so nice to receive so many gifts, right? Um, <laughs> so, so, I, so and it, it really shook me and I then went back home and I couldn't sleep. I was tossing and turning and next morning I thought I will find a way to, to to do something about it. So I wrote an email to the curator of the British Museum proposing to curate an exhibition, take the objects back to India, and let the people see that, uh, the objects, and let them decide whether they want to keep it there or send it back to the UK. <laughs> uh, so I sent one email, there was no reply. I sent another very polite email, may I please request, I just learned the, the British politeness there. <laughs> uh, but it didn't sort of work, and then I got very angry. Then I was like, fuck. Now I'm going to fucking steal everything. Uh, so I, I went into the British... I, I then started to sort of make a plan as to how to steal the objects. Uh, and I made a blueprint and, and I started going to the British Museum like a regular uh, sort of tourist. Figured out how many guards are there, where are the cameras. Uh, I think I was also watching a lot of Mission Impossible at that time. <laughs> uh, and then I came back and, and then I realized that I needed some sort of a distraction to distract the attention of the guard, so I had to think of a bomb, like a non-violent bomb, which would just make some fuzz and sound in the distraction. I would bump into an object and sort of take it and... But then, in thinking so, I realized that, uh, okay, I would, I would take the objects and return it back to the person who it belongs to. But then I realized that th these are objects stolen from the third or the fourth century, and these people are dead, buried, or probably preserved in some ethnographic museum already. Uh, so, in thinking so, then I also realized that they're stolen from the Indian subcontinent, which doesn't exist anymore. I mean, it's now India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. And, and then also started to think about what would happen to the empty spaces in the British Museum when I steal these objects. Am I erasing your history of colonization? Will that mean that colonization never happened? And in thinking so, I realized that my problem is not so with the objects, but more so with the misrepresentation of the labels. So I wanted to change the labels. But by the time I arrived to that thought, my visa expired and I had to leave the UK. <laughs> uh, so I could never return back. So in the performance, uh, I, I tell this story. Uh, I, I tell this story. And I also asked the audience if... Um, I, I asked him, I, I said, I say that I might be talking from a very other world perspective, uh, but I'm very curious to know what, what do people think there and half are the uh, labels misrepresented or not. And half of the people agree or disagree, and so we divide the audience uh, into two different sections. And uh, people who agreed that the labels are misrepresented, they are, it is now their responsibility to go into the British Museum and change the label since I can't go there. Uh, first of all, I don't have enough money to prove and pay for the visa fee, and plus, I can't tell in my visa interview that I'm going there too. Um, so, so then, so then we convert the entire theatre space into a into a miniature British museum where people who agreed to change the labels, uh, one of them volunteers to sort of do that, and people who disagree can get to play the guards at the British Museum. 
uh, and then there is a chase game which happens. Um, and, uh, but the audience get these labels which are uh, stolen from the Indian subcontinent, waiting to be returned, bloody souvenir, <laughs> um, and museum of the yeah. International Museum of the Stolen Goods. Yeah. And uh, I can, yeah, I mean, it is up to them. So we treat the rehearsal space or the performance space as a rehearsal space for dis civil disobedience. And then it is up to their responsibility to go and change the labels. So Abhishek, um, art as civil disobedience, art as uh, um, a rallying cry somehow, mm -hmm. finding like-minded people and mm -hmm. uh, in a way go back into the history to, to flip and change. Yeah. Um, you also are an Indian who lived most of his life in India, mm -hmm. who didn't live under colonization, but mm -hmm. in a place which kind of was formed, influenced by the history of colonization. Yeah. And, you know, many, many political upheavals <coughs> that followed afterwards, mm -hmm. you could s say, were the result of, mm -hmm. you know, all the centuries that were mm -hmm. before it. And in your work, you dealt with displacement, similar to Onyas, mm -hmm. being from one part of yeah. the subcontinent, which became Pakistan, and mm -hmm. then you had to go to India, and then you had to move again and again mm -hmm. and again. Um, you, you have an object with you that is related to this story, right? Yeah. Do, you want to, do you want to show that to the audience? Uh, yeah, it's um, uh, it's um, it's a lemon pickle. Um, it looks uh, slightly black. Uh, it's about uh, now um, 19 years old. It was made by my grandfather just before he died, and then my father preserved it as a memory of him. It's still edible. Uh, it has become black over the course of time, uh, and the. I have a performance uh, where I start the performance. It's called My Home at the Intersection, and it starts with opening the jar of this lemon pickle and, um, and sharing little bits of uh, the pickle, which is like extremely potent, uh, with the audience. And the opening the jar becomes a way to enter back into the memory through the taste and the, and the smell. Uh, and uh, I mean, for me, like, the smell takes me back. It's, it's a memory tool uh, which I use uh, not only in the performance, but also when we are in the house, you know, like uh, on our dinner tables, like we would put the pickle and then the stories would start to unfold. And uh, although like um, my grandparents sort of kind of moved or let's say relocated in 40, 1947, uh, and uh, we grew up with like many stories about uh, what it meant for them to to move and to relocate. Uh, but it's it's always uh, interesting because th there is always a flip filter, uh, let's say, or, or a. Um, it's never directly spoken about, but it sort of creeps in through like different things and stuff. Um, for example, uh, my grandfather, like he. When we, when we were young, we would watch India and Pakistan cricket match, and India and Pakistan cricket match is more than just a cricket match. Just to and give context about that, yeah. it's because your grandfather at that time was an Indian by where he lived, but he relocated from a place that then became Pakistan. So he yeah, gave I up. Mean, I, there was no India back then, yeah. uh, but he, the fact that like he was raised as a Sikh in a Hindu family, and that's a different sort of... Uh, story altogether. It used to happen quite in the past where a um, Hindu family would raise one of their children as a Sikh, uh, and next generation would follow Sikhism. And but that kind of stopped after 1947. It reduced, but then uh, specifically after 1984-85, it sort of completely cut down. Uh, so he moved. Uh, sorry, baby. <laughs> so you are from a family that moved from what today is called Pakistan. Yeah. And then go to what today is called India. Yeah, yeah. And your grandfather, who has his roots in that place, mm. finds himself looking at a cricket match. Yeah. And somehow yeah. is looking at friend, enemy, what is friend, what is enemy, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in, in the sense, like, there is, like, in the, there's a lot of discourse of, there was, like, a lot of, there's a lot of animosity which is generated. Uh, I don't believe that the animosity is generated by purely by people, but it's a lot of propaganda and and things. And uh, but he was one. 
we would sit at the cricket match and even if Pakistan wins, he would still clap. And we would be angry and say, like, why, why are you clapping? Like, you know, like, he's like, no, but it's a cricket match. Like, it doesn't matter who wins, who loses. Uh, and this is someone, he's someone, like, who moved, who had to move, not moved, but had to move. Um, and, uh, I mean, there are stories we, we grew up with, but in the sense of how we related back is, uh, uh, it happened, the relocation also happened uh, in 1991 for, for, for me when I was uh, six years old. Um, there was a rise of um, a, a particular movement, uh, uh, which is called the Khalistan Movement, where uh, a group of Sikh militants were asking for an autonomous state, a buffer state between Pakistan and India called Khalistan, uh, which was supposedly uh, supposed to be a land for the Sikhs. Uh, and we had to uh, relocate as well. Uh, so this constant moving of displacement uh, was something uh, which sort of reiterated quite a lot, especially when it happened in 1991. Uh, and we as kids were never told what exactly happened. Uh, we were told that there are good schools in other cities, or there's a big storm coming, let's move, because um, me and my sister were like, very young. Uh, and, and this house was later demolished, uh, and then my parents came back in 1995, uh, when the situation got a bit better. But they would never cross, and everything was fine, my father then built another house in a different place. But my parents would never cross the road where the old house used to be. And uh, we never spoke about this. So then after 27 years, I proposed to him that I want to go back and find and rebuild the house. So we took a, it's a flat land. We took a lot of furniture and we reset up the house as it was uh, without the walls. And we lived there for like a day. Um, and in, in the performance, my home at the intersection, I uh, talk about that this, this going back is not to remember, but to forget about it. So it's, um, it's so basically Abhishek, to, to bring your story into a few concrete images for the people who are listening to it. Mm -hmm. You have uh, a family that goes to a house that doesn't exist mm -hmm. and physically maps out the house and lives there for a day. Yeah. A performance of one day to deal with a dark past from your family, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Then you have a performance of going into the British Museum and changing the labels, which also you can't physically do in the British Museum. Yeah. So you map it out in a theater space mm -hmm. And then that's where you play it. Yeah. So in a way, your work, I don't know if I'm correct in doing mm -hmm. it, but maybe in my mind that wants to make it simple and concrete, mm -hmm. you are someone who recreates every time the image of something that you can't physically grasp to deal with it today. Yeah. I mean, uh, try, so, so the, the, the encounter with the real is something uh, which is always... Um, at the back of the mind or the peripheral vision, let's say, as an artist. Uh, and that sometimes happens to be in a theatrical uh, framework or in a more participatory, but sometimes also in a public space as well. Um, so it really depends on what my intentions are, what my fascinations are, uh, but very much... Um, um, very concretely, Abhishek, because yeah. that's what they're looking for. You bring the pickles of your grandfather over thousands of miles, mm. and then you put that in the mouth of someone mm. who might be the descendant of one of the colonizers, mm -hmm. and then some magic happens. Yeah. Can we summarize it like that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, not to cut you there, because mm. I don't want you to speak on forever, yeah. because I know that we can have these conversations, <laughs> but because I want them to kind of taste your work and, mm -hmm. and what that means to them and how in some ways in parallel two artists deal with these dark pages of the past, of your past and that of the former colonizers, mm -hmm. um, telling and retelling and the physical objects that you carried with you. Um, this one particular conversation, uh, we're going we're gonna to stop right here. I am going to look at my phone because I do think that a few more um, uh, things were set sent to us. One is, um, okay, we have a reader who says that um, we are now seeing historical objects being robbed from Syria at this one particular moment. Mm. 
and they're being taken out. So while you're talking about stealing from the museum from, uh, uh, from, from the UK and taking it to India, we see now that the places where we come from, the objects are being stolen and taken away, being caught in an endless cycle of telling stories and retelling our stories. Um, one, more, one more thought that was sent to me by Janine McGee. If there is consent from the culture which is displayed, I don't see the problem. But then again, that would require a voice in this matter, which some groups have been robbed of, such as civilizations which have ceased to exist. And this, of course, goes on and on and on with many more comments. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the conversation right here because uh, I feel that what we brought is enough to keep on talking even when the live stream is over. And that always has been the aim for the talks that we had. We want, uh, we want you to be part of a stream of the conversation and you guys afterwards can continue talking. You can go on the social media and, and continue it. But the tradition here in our studio is that whatever we discussed, whatever we brought for you is summarized poetically by uh, my favorite uh, stand-up poet of the Netherlands, which is Marco van der Linde. Um, ladies and gentlemen, give a warm round of applause for Marco. In the Royal Institute of Tropics stands a tree, a tropical tree that was trimmed from the earth and re-rooted in the flatlands of the museum floor. To remind us our roots are not our own, Dutch DNA is just a compost composite of the soil that we loot. My name is a rallying cry. If this museum tree extends a root, wriggles it through the concrete floor and under earth out into the square and people see it there, is it still a museum worthy root? Still exotic? No, it's just a stray a piece of shrubbery, not given its humanity and chopped off. Now the tree has lost a toe, but you wouldn't know. It has trouble standing tall, but you can't see that through the museum wall. My name is a rallying cry. Now pop, 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 new root toes frantically grow, looking for balance, but the owners say, hey, this tree is out of control. It grows through walls and floors, we cannot shut the doors. Such a rebel tree. And isn't it really about the facade that we see? So they hollow out its core, and they make its roots no more, and they hammer it to a frame because the tree still looks the same. They'll never know. My name is a rallying cry. But one toe remains, somehow overlooked, estranged, bursting with a life force and determined to grow. And this toe, this root, wriggles itself from under the roof of the museum, under all of Amsterdam, until finally it reaches its destination. The empty palace on the dam. Sensing its emptiness, the tree begins. My name is a rallying cry. It shoots legs out of toes, body out of legs, arms out of body, and now it shoots out a head, a head of tree growing out of the top of the palace on the dam. And from the windows, it reaches out big branch arms. And finally, a finger, a finger with on it a label, a label that says, I am a gift to the Netherlands and I have taken my place. So ladies and gents in the theater back home, thank you so much for being part of this second of four talks. We hoped to have opened some of the doors, we hoped to have kicked down some of the walls, we hope that something of what we talked will resonate and will open discussions that you will bring back to us. We are back tomorrow and the day after. We're going to talk about the rebirth of the hero from an artistic perspective, both of how in stories the protagonist metaphorically, maybe literally, has to die to be reborn again and how sometimes artists have to do the same. And finally, on the last day of our talks, we will talk about how um, 
the corona times have forced us to reinvent ourselves as artists. What do we do in these times when only a few people are allowed in? But that's for tomorrow and the day after. For today, thank you so much for being part of this stream. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.